All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the Release Automation Community webcast today. Our topic today is Release Automation and Release Automation Continuous Delivery Edition V6 Architecture Overview. I'm now going to hand the call over to Keith Puzzi, who's going to give the presentation. Go ahead, Keith. Thanks, Melanie. <clears throat> so, good morning, good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining the WebEx today. Uh, what we're going to talk about the next sort of 45 minutes or so is uh, an overview of the architecture for release automation and release automation continuous delivery edition. So we'll go through the, the two components, uh, how they integrate separately and how they integrate together. Uh, we'll do high level architecture, so really the, the big picture, and then get down into some of the detail about how you can do things like cloud variability, how you work with firewalls, and also how you architect your execution service. Uh, and finally, we'll end with recommendations on some best practice when you're actually architecting release automation. Uh, as we go through, uh, there's a, a there's a Q and A box on the screen. So, if as I go through, you have any questions, please put the questions in there. And what we're going to do is, as we get to certain break points in the presentation, uh, we'll answer questions as we go, and at the end, we'll open it up for questions at the end as well. So why is it important? Obviously, uh, there's actually quite a lot of you on the call today, and that's great to see. Uh, obviously, it's important to understand how release automation works, uh, some of the internal workings, interconnection. So when you're actually designing the implementation of release automation, you understand how things connect. And also, it's very important when you're troubleshooting to know, you know what logs to look at. Because as we talk about the protocols and the connections, uh, that when you get an issue with the product, uh, that drives you to which log to look in to help troubleshoot, and I'm sure you will know this. So as we go through the deck, we're going to start first with just a, an overview of the products. So as you can see, here's a timeline of release automation going back to Nolio, so Nolio 3.3 .3 at the left, all the way through to release automation 6.2 on the right. Um, so release automation 6.2 is currently in customer, customer validation in its beta mode. So that's been worked on now and will be released towards the end of July. So uh, the 6-2 time frame here is end of July. And what you're looking at here is, is two things. One, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have the end of service announcements. So if you're an existing release automation customer, if you look at this list, um, you can see uh, where we are planning to drop the end of service for each of these releases. So as you can see, the, the four versions were dropped in October. Uh, next year in February, the 5.0s have been dropped, and then there'll be the 5.5s in April. Now, the end of service is purely the fact that we don't create fixes anymore. So when you phone support, if they have an issue, they won't create a fix for a version that's been end of service, but expect to upgrade. Um, that, that's the primary thing we're talking about here. But also in this deck, what it shows is uh, upgrade paths. So if you were on 5.0, the upgrade path is here. So to get to 6.0, you'd have to go 5.0 to 5.5, and then 5.5, you can go all the way up to 6.1. Um, the last thing on this slide is 6.1 uh, is going to be um, like a, um, a landing point for us. So the future upgrades will be from 6.1 up. So in future upgrades, you'll need to get from where you are to 6.1, and then from 6.1, you would upgrade to 6.2, 6.3, and beyond. So this is kind of a break point. So as you're planning your upgrades over the next sort of six months to a year, uh, you should be aiming to get to the 6.1 version, and from there, it's just an upgrade from 6.1 to the ongoing version. So moving on from that, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the terminology, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing as we go through the architecture. So obviously as Nolio and Release Automation, uh, the various components have been called various things, uh, and these are just the names of what you might call uh, various components. So, so the ROC, the Release Operation Center, there's the Web UI, obviously the Nexus that we ship the product, the RSAC repository. Um, most people still call the data manager the NEC. Uh, officially, it's the data manager. So you have the management server, data manager, NEC. That's basically all the same thing, just different names. This is our execution servers, and we'll talk about that shortly. And obviously, then with the UI, we have the automation studio UI, 
uh, ASAP, as it's called, design a UI in Sugar as an agent in databases. And what we're going to talk about first is, is release automation. So we're going to start with a, a simple uh, slide that explains what is the architecture of release automation. So as you can see, it's a, it's a three-tier architecture. So we have the management server uh, that's really the heart of the implementation. Uh, it's the component that has the release execution engine. It's where the UI attaches to. It connects the database. Uh, and basically, without the management server, uh, nothing really works. So the management server is your top level of your three tiers. Below that, we have the, the execution server. So your execution server is this messaging bus that switches from the management server to the agent. All traffic goes via the execution server. So the management server will communicate with an execution server that then communicates with the third tier, which is the agent. So this is our, our three-tier model that we have for the product. And as a, a moving on from that, this is the actual interconnection. So when we talk about our management server talking to an execution server, uh, we basically have two protocols. We, we have the, the HTTP protocol, and we have ActiveMQ. So the HTTP is used for initiating releases, and the ActiveMQ bus is for sending events back to the management server. So the agent will pass its messages via NIMI, so you can see the bottom of the screen here. Um, Execution server to agent communication is via NIMI, which is a proprietary protocol. The execution server then passes that data back to the management server via the ActiveMQ bus, and the management server then deals with whatever needs to be done and will update the database. And we can show that on this uh, architecture slide. So this is a very simple architecture. Now, with release automation, um, Everything on here can be in one machine. If you've got a lab environment or a test environment, uh, you can have a single instance that has a database, the management server, the execution server, and an agent all running on the same machine. That's perfectly fine for you know, your, your testing and small, very small environments. The normal architecture would be you would have a management server. Um, the database, again, normally is remote from the management server. And then execution servers would be placed near to where the agents are. So your management server would tend to be uh, centrally placed, so near to the users, near to the artifact repositories, obviously near to the database. And your execution servers are near to the agents, and obviously the agents are on the endpoints being managed wherever they are. Now on this slide, it shows you all the interconnection. That you can see here that these green and black lines that's the, the HTTP and XMQ connection between the management server and the execution server. The red line, this is NIMI. This is NIMI between the execution server and the agent. And then we have obviously things like um, if you send emails from the management server, obviously we have access to an SMTP server. If you use an uh, Active Directory for authentication, there will be a link from the management server to the Active Directory server. Obviously a link to the database. Uh, if you use the, the inbuilt, in, inbuilt Action Pack Manager service, that also, this connection here, is an FTP connection to the CA network. So in the rock, if you go to the Action Manager where you can download Action Pack, um, the, the service that runs on the management server actually communicates with an FTP location to, to identify the Action Pack. And that's this link here. And obviously, we have the UI. So in this case, um, normal web UI. Now, what you see on the screen, everything you can see here can also be secured. So uh, we ship out-of-the-box certificates that you can enable for you know, SSL at the front end. Uh, you can enable TLS. You can enable encryption for NIMI. So all of that is in place. And also, you can use your own um, custom certificates if you want to. So this is your, your high-level overview of release automation. What I want to show you next is how Release Automation CDE maps to this. So Release Automation CDE is a companion product that comes with Release Automation. Uh, again, it's a three-tier architecture. And again, it's based on Tomcat. So 
We have a central management server, so we have a Tomcat instance running our management server at the top end. We then have our, our abstraction layer, our plugins. So our plugins then can be remotely installed or on the same machine as the management server. And then the endpoints are the, the components you're connecting to, the products you're connecting to. If I show you uh, the next graphic, you'll see that. So as you can see here, what we have here is our end users using the web browsers, they communicate with the, the CDE server, the Continuous Delivery Edition server. This server has a, a connection to its database, so the database currently is MySQL, so again that could be on the same server or remote. Uh, again, you can use Active Directory, so this can be configured to talk to an Active Directory domain controller for authentication, and also as of version 6.2, that is currently in customer validation. Um, we also have a notification service. So the, the, the continuous delivery edition product can also send emails as, um, as you use the product and things are task completed, releases are built, releases are started. They can send emails to users based on actions within the CDE product. So this is the management layer. And to the right of that, we have the plugins. So if you installed CDE, what you'll get is the CDE manager and all the plugins will be automatically installed into the same instance. So the product comes as, as WAR files. You have a, a, a primary WAR file that's the manager. And each of these plugins is an additional WAR file. So you drop these plugins, these WAR files, into your Tomcat folder. Tomcat will then burst those out and make them available and register them. So automatically, these plugins will be connected and come available. And these are the plugins we have today. We have uh, Release Automation, uh, Agile Central, Jira, and a REST plugin for integrating to any, any product that supports REST. And what I mean by these plugins, if you imagine in Release Automation um, CDE, what you want to do is you want to build a release, uh, and perhaps the first task is you want to run uh, deployment from Release Automation. The task would actually leverage the plugin, the release automation plugin, and then it would pass to the release automation server you've specified which um, deployment you want to run. So the task may just say, run deployment A in this release automation server. Uh, it can be across applications, it can be across release automation servers. So within the continuous delivery edition product, we can connect to different release automation servers uh, and like I said, we can deliver across different applications. We could also have tasks for doing things like updating Jira, updating the Valley product, Agile Central, and also making calls to REST. So all these plugins, um, this is the, the starting point for our plugins. More are coming. So as we add more of these products, you will see more plugins being added to the, the portfolio. The link between the, the CD manager and the plugin server is a web-based link, HTTP link. Um, from the plugins to the endpoint, that can change, and that depends on the technology that the endpoint requires. Uh, in this instance, they're all actually HTTP, but that doesn't mean that will be the case you know, with, with future plugins. So if you look at what we've just done, we've just looked at, you know, we've got this architecture for release automation. We've got this architecture for the continuous delivery edition. We can then join those together, and this would be a sample of how the two together would be architected. So the, the bottom part of the screen is your release automation system. So that's an exact copy of what we've looked at before. So that's your management server, your execution servers. And the connectivity here is basically how you would link the continuous delivery edition server to release automation. You literally have that one connection. And that then means from release automation continuous delivery edition, um, you can trigger deployments within release automation. Now, obviously, this is very much a, a simplistic view. Uh, when you actually deploy into production, it's quite possible what you'll do is you'll need to make either the whole of the solution or certain components highly available. And this is how you would do that. So if you imagine these three tiers, so we talk about the three-tier architecture. 
to make the solution fully highly available, you would have to make all three tiers highly available, which is what's on the screen and we'll talk about shortly. Now that's not always the case. It, kind of, it depends on your business as to how highly available you need your solution to be. Um, some businesses are quite happy with taking an outage for a few hours uh, and basically a good backup policy can restore an environment. Uh, others, they need 99.9% .9 uptime, in which case you need something like this for fully highly availability. And there's probably things in between. There's things in between. So in this instance, what we've got is um, the management service here uh, can be configured as a pair uh, and it's an active passive pair. So this proxy server, which we don't supply, this is something that you would supply, basically routes all traffic to the active node. So this node would be the active node, uh, and this node would be in standby, just sitting there idly waiting. And they actually heartbeat via the database. So the, man, the active node is writing a timestamp to the database, and the passive node is watching that timestamp. And in the event of that timestamp stopping, then the active node, will, the, the other node will take over. They will actually fail over. So that's all automatic, the failover. So we have the active passive management server. Obviously, the, the database is key to release automation because that, that is really the thing that contains the, the current state of the processes, the releases, um, everything is in the database. So the database needs to be highly available, whichever way you would do that. Obviously, that depends on the technology, be that clustered or rack or whatever it is. You need to make sure the database <coughs> is highly available. And also the repository. This is our nexus you need to make sure that that is also resilient. And then as you move to the, the lower tier, uh, you can actually double up the execution service, which we're going to talk about in a second, so we'll come back to that. That's called supernoding. And also, you can actually uh, configure the agent to also talk to mobile execution servers. And again, we're going to come back to that when we cover the execution service in just a few slides. Now, we've actually got a break here, and I think it's a good time. I, I see some questions in the Q&A. And let me just check if any questions we can talk about now. Uh, just a reminder, if you have a question, you can enter it into the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand uh, side of your screen. All right, so we've got one question about um, the XMQ bus uh, running on the NAC with the XMQ client on the NES. Uh, yes, that's correct. So the, it's an XMQ bus network um, client on the NES, manager on the, on the NAC. And you've asked, can you secure the action pack update over FTP port 21? Uh, how do you ensure no tampering with action pack? That's a very good question. Um, I know one customer, what they do is they actually have uh, an FTP server within their network. So they actually have a very simple FTP server where they copy the action packs they want to use from the CA one to that FTP server. And you can reconfigure the update service to point to that FTP site. So there's a file called, uh, I think it's URL.ini in the update service folder, which points to the FTP location. Um, you can easily redirect that to any FTP site, and you can then manage the content on that on your own FTP server if you want to. Um, I hope that answers your question. If not, um, please put another question in. We'll come back to it in a while. And also, how can you how the HA time set mechanism work? Okay, so, so one of the questions also is how the timestamping works for the HA. Uh, it's actually very simple. So both of your management servers, your active passive management servers, um, we expect the clocks on those machines to be correct and to be the same, basically, within a, a few seconds. Um, and that's all it is. It's very simple. The, the active node is writing that timestamp on a regular basis to the database, and the passive node is then checking that timestamp. As long as it's within, within a certain tolerance, uh, the active node is happy to say the passive, the passive node is happy to say the active node is still valid and still running. So it's literally just um, the local time from the machine, the two management servers, being used as a reference to make sure that they're actually uh, both active. So the next thing I want to talk about is the, the execution, execution server architecture. Now, what we talk about here is um, you may have heard terms like star, double star, ring. There's various ways that we configure the 
interconnectivity of an execution server. Now, when I say that, um, there's two things to consider. One is that the, the execution servers talk to the management servers using ActiveMQ and HTTP, and that, that's always there. So every execution server must talk to the management server. There's a secondary configuration, which is what we call the routing configuration. And you need to do this if you need to pass artifacts around your network. So as you can see here, if your agents report to multiple execution servers, and you need to better copy artifacts between those agents and they're in different execution servers, you need to define routing rules, which we're going to talk about. The same if you're passing uh, parameters between agents. Uh, they pass over this, this routing that you create. If you have a single execution server and all the agents talk to that one execution server, then you don't need to talk about this. It's literally just, it just works. The product just works. And to try and make this clearer, um, a simple example. So uh, since version 5, we've had this concept of the artifact distribution. So if you look at this, this graphic, on the right-hand side here, what we have is our retrieval agent group. So a retrieval agent is an agent whose job is to actually retrieve the data from wherever you're defined to be. That could be a repository, it could be a file share, it could be, as you can see here, it could be any of these options. Um, you'll define that this artifact exists in a certain location. And these agents are the agents that are used to actually retrieve those artifacts. So in the event of a deployment that needs an artifact, uh, the management server will communicate with the execution server to tell the agent or the agent group to go and get the file, get the artifact. Once that's been retrieved, the, the agent will send that artifact to the execution server. Now, if the target agent is attached to the same execution server, then we'll just send it straight to that agent. If the target agent is on a different execution server, that's when we then rely on these routing rules. So this execution server will say, I need to deploy this artifact to this agent. How do I get to this agent? And within the routing rules, it will know that to get to this agent, I need to go via this execution server. And there are various ways that you can architect this, and that's what we're going to talk about next, is the different methodologies you can use to actually build this, this framework. For the routing. And I'm just going to go for the examples. So there's a, a simple example <coughs> is what we call a star. Now a star works in this instance here. You can see um, we have like a, a central location. So this location up here is where we have our artifacts. <coughs> it's our central location. It's where the artifact's going to come from. We have a retrieval agent whose job is to retrieve that artifact. Uh, and the artifacts that this agent retrieves could get deployed to any one of these agents. So within our architecture, uh, all of these agents are valid targets for artifacts that come from here. So in that instance, what we have to do is we have to then define these rules. These blue lines actually are the routing rules. Now, when I say a routing rule, uh, let me show you what that means. If you see on the left-hand side here, we have this this ASAP screen. So currently this has to be done in the ASAP UI. This, this has not been ported yet to the, um, the box. So what you do is you actually right click on the execution server. And on the bottom of the screen, you would then see all of the, the other uh, execution servers. So you can see here we've got two. So imagine this one here is this one here. So this machine is this one. And I want to create these relationships. What I would do is I would click on the little tick box next to each of these, and that would then build the relationship. That would say that this execution server needs to talk to this one and this one and this one. Uh, and you're defining the routing rules. Uh, what you're actually doing is you're actually editing the NIMI config on those execution servers. So uh, I know many customers that just do this via the NIMI config file, um, or you can do it for the UI. Uh, you literally, it's the same thing. If you do it in the UI, when you click go, if you check the NIMI config file, you'll find the update in that config file. Yeah. 
so in our instance, we know that if this agent needs to deploy to this agent here, agent one, what will happen is the agent retrieves the artifact, sends it to execution server A. Using the internal routing within the execution servers, this execution server knows to send the artifact to execution server C, which then knows to send it to the agent. So it's normal kind of network routing that we're talking about here. Now this, this, this works perfectly fine for most customers. Um, the, only, the only limitation with this is obviously that uh, should this execution server go offline for any reason, the deployment will stop because it, it's, it's a single point of failure. So we need to address that, and we can do that in a couple of ways. So one way is by making sure that the retrieval agent has two execution servers. So when we talk about SuperNesis, what we're talking about is making the agents resilient to an execution server going offline. So within the NIMI config of the agent, by default, you'll have um, an IP address of an execution server. And agents generally are connected to a single execution server. So they're out of the box when you first install the product, that's what happens. Uh, you can add additional execution servers. So in this case, we can add another one. And what happens is, when the agent starts, it will try and connect to the primary execution server. And if it can, it will connect and it will start working. If that execution server doesn't respond, the agent will automatically then go to the secondary one. So what we've built is uh, resilience at the agent layer. So the agent now has two routes. As long as one of these execution servers is running, you can get to that agent. So that's created this first level of resilience for the agent. Now the next level is how do you make the actual execution server network itself resilient? Uh, and this is when we talk about double stars. So before, when we had the single star, if you remember, we didn't have this execution server. What we had is basically this server here talking to these three machines, and this agent talking to this execution. So we had a, a single star. Um, the benefit of the double star, or yeah, double star, is that basically we can lose either one of these execution servers and things will carry on working. So in the event that this execution server B were to go offline or not be available, this agent can still send its data to here and that can be routed by this mechanism and vice versa. So we basically remove that single point of failure within this architecture. Now what we, there's another option apart from double star and that's what we call the ring. And it's very similar. So in this case, you can see here, we have, we have two data centers. And what we need is the traffic to stay in each data center. So data center one, we have all our agents here reporting to these two execution servers. Um, they're both, they're all the agents are configured for both. So either execution server going down will not affect anything. But our routing rules are in this ring like we've got here. Uh, and again, this means no single point of failure. In the event of this execution server failing, um, you can still get, you can go the other, you can go clockwise around the ring to get to the other execution servers, or anti-clockwise. Yeah, so basically, you've got the option of deploying to, you can still connect to all agents if you lose a, a single execution server. Um, this tends to be very popular with customers, sort of medium-sized customers, who have so four, five, six execution servers. If you get to the point of a lot of execution servers, no 15, 20, uh, this architecture is not so good because what you're looking to do is manage the amount of routing that goes on. So here you've got a very simple routing rule. So A talks to B, that's the rule. When you look to the double star, the actual routing within the product is actually more complex. So uh, there's more logic there to actually maintain the hops and the routing that we need. So for a, a small company, oh, a small deployment so with a four, five, six NESs, normally the ring is sufficient to cope with that. Um, but at this point, I'd say there's always, you no. Know, talk to us. If you're, when you're planning this, talk to CA about what you're planning, and we can advise you as to the best, best architecture. And that kind of moves on to our, our best practice. So one thing to do is if you imagine if you have a, a star, so you have a central execution server and then you have lower secondary execution servers, um, and you define the routing 
So the central execution server is talking to 10 lower execution servers. If you define that rule from the top to the bottom, the central execution server has to actually maintain those 10 connections. And it does that by, by polling each one and then making sure the links are selected. If you have one or two or three execution servers go offline, that can affect the polling cycle we have and it can affect other issues. So we recommend normally that the, the lower tier execution servers connect to the top tier. That, that just means that we have less, um, less routing rules and less connectivity and it actually makes it more efficient. Which kind of leads on to the second point, um, be very careful of not creating loops. So you can actually, I've seen before where all execution servers affect all execution servers. Um, and within the product, that can cause routing issues and looping issues, uh, which then cause issues with deployment. And what I mean by that is, if there's a routing issue, you may be going to try to copy a file from two agents across the network, uh, and it fails. And that could fail because we have an issue with routing within the product. So um, be mindful of the fact that we keep it simple wherever possible when creating routing rules. Also, when you actually define this connectivity, um, you define the connection from the execution servers within the product, you, the actual connection itself is bi-directional. So you define it in one direction, and that's the direction the connection is initiated. So if you say the execution server A talks to B, the next execution server A will initiate the connection. Once the connection is open, data flows both ways. So the actual artifact movement can go in either direction. It doesn't rely on the way you actually define the connection. And as I mentioned, um, the star and double star you tend to find with much larger deployments, and the ring architecture you tend to find with you no know, four or five execution servers. But that, that's not a hard and fast rule. But like I say, I would always recommend that you talk to us about what your architect is. And that kind of moves on to how you would then do this within a firewall. So quite often in deployments, you find that either agents or execution servers need to be placed outside a firewall. And we have two examples of how you can actually architect this. Uh, this is the first example, which is the simplest. So in this case, um, we have a small number of agents outside the firewall. So in this case, we have two. And we need to be able to deploy and manage the agents outside the firewall. So our execution server is on the inside. Now the default way that an agent works is when the agent starts, it will initiate the connection to the execution server. So this agent, when it starts, will actually make an inbound call to the execution server to initiate the connection over NIMI. And basically once that connection is made, the agent's online. Now generally, uh, with lots of customers and firewalls, inbound connections are not normally allowed or it's hard to get justification. And what's normally needed is an outbound connection. So we need the execution server to initiate the connection and to maintain it. Uh, and you can do that by, by doing this. So on this execution server, if you go to the config and you look in this reverse settings section, you can add the IP addresses of these nodes on the outside. And when the execution server goes around, um, it'll actually initiate the connection and maintain it. So when the execution start, server starts, it will make the connection to the agent. If the agent goes offline, you can see down here you've got polling intervals, how often it will check. So if the agent goes offline, it then goes through a polling cycle, waiting for the agent to come back. Once it's back, it'll make the initial connection and keep that connection open. Uh, this works really well if you have a relatively small number of agents on the outside of the firewall because you're maintaining this file on these, these NIMI configs. If you have a, a lot of agents that are going to be outside the firewall, we'd normally recommend this architecture. And the difference is uh, we've moved an execution server outside. So in this case, uh, we've installed an execution server outside the firewall. This then manages all the agents. So the agents all work as they do normally. They start they connect to the execution server. It's a normal way that agents work. And then what we've got is uh, this execution server is communicating back inside. So the green and the black line are 
the standard connectivity for an execution server. That's your HTTP and your XMQ connection back to the management server, which you always, always have. This red line is actually, uh, we defined uh, an execution server routing rule. So what we've said is that this execution server has a routing rule to this execution server. And we defined it as an outbound. So when this execution server starts, it will initiate the connection to this execution server and keep it open. And when that's there, we can then transfer artifacts and everything from the agents outside here to the agents inside via this, this connection. And again, this is NIMI. So if we're deploying an artifact, uh, this agent would retrieve it. So in this case, we're retrieving the artifact from a, a repository. It then moves it to the execution server, which then understands the, root, <coughs> the routing, and will then send it via the firewall port to the execution server to the agent. So in this instance, we have three firewall ports open here. We have the HTTP and XMQ back to management server, and the NIMI connection from this execution server to this one. Now, at the moment, we've talked a lot about release automation. Um, we can also do a similar thing with the continu continuous delivery edition product, in that we can separate the plugin. So um, the management server can be placed wherever it needs to be placed. Again, it would normally be placed near to where the, the users are that are going to use it. But if there was an instance where you need to put the plugin uh, on the other side of Firewall, you can actually break these apart. So all you need is a Tomcat instance. So in this case, we've got a Tomcat here. You copy the plugin WAR files into that Tomcat. They're activated. You can initiate a connection from here to here. And again, this is a HTTP connection. And then from here, the plugin will talk to the, to the, the endpoint you're trying to get to. So in this case, we have uh, a Tomcat server inside our firewall, which is connecting to Agile Central and REST. Another Tomcat server outside our firewall, which has been used to talk to police automation and Jira, as an example. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a similar methodology to the way that release automation works. Uh, and like I said before, it's all based on Tomcat. So all you need is a, a Tomcat server, Windows or Linux, and then the relevant plugin, and then you just define the connection. So the next thing we're going to talk about is, because we're kind of running out of time, is our recommendations. Um, so based on all the things we just talked about, what we're going to go through is basically our, our best practices and recommendations, things that you should consider when you're architecting release automation. So the first thing you should always consider is that the, the NAC, the management server, should be one, close to the database, so close as in a, a reliable fast connection. Um, it is very important that the management server has a reliable connection to the database. Also, it would be close to the repository, and also generally it would be near to the end users. So uh, you may have found uh, the old ASAP UI historically has had problems if it's remote from the management server. When I say remote, I mean the other side of the world. Uh, I had a customer that had uh, launching ASAP in somewhere in Asia, Thailand or somewhere. The management server was in London, and the latency sometimes cause issues. Now, as we move to the rock and it's a web UI, that, that issue kind of goes away. But we still kind of recommend that the, the management server would be close to the end users. The database and the management server we recommend is on separate machines. Uh, most customers work with that case. Uh, but like I said, they need to be close together for making sure we have good connectivity and performance. And the execution servers should be near to the agent. So this is part of the Arc 3 to architecture is making sure that the um, you have an execution server close to where your target machine. Now the, the way you architect this depends on a lot of things. There's the sizing, the scaling, uh, where machines physically are, size of artifacts. Um, but rule of, rule of thumb is uh, data, each data center should have, have at least have an execution server. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, execution servers, uh, you can have one, you can have many. So uh, you can scale the product out by adding more execution servers. So a single execution server as of 6.x can support up to 1,000 agents. 
Now, when we say a thousand agents, uh, that's a thousand connected agents. So, when you actually configure the agent registering, uh, each execution server can have up to a thousand. When you actually run deployments, the number of current agents running is 400. So, out of those thousand, uh, we only recommend you, only, you have 400 running at one point in time. Uh, that works for the majority of customers I work with. Uh, like I said, execution servers tend to be either geographically placed, so near to the targets across the WAN, or it may be due to security and firewalls in different departments. You have to place them for those reasons because there are limitations on uh, network connectivity. Um, you basically have to look at the, the bigger picture of where the agents are and then place your execution servers accordingly. As I mentioned, the, the management server um, is an active standby if you use the HA. So uh, we don't currently support active active, we only support active standby. When we're talking about retrieval agents, so um, a retrieval agent is the agent that will go to the repository and collect files. We always recommend that you use groups wherever possible. So if you actually look at an artifact within the rock when you define it, you define which agent is used to actually retrieve that file. If you use an agent and not a group and that agent's offline, you can't retrieve that artifact. So we always recommend that you set up uh, artifact agent groups. Those groups should contain at least two agents, if not more. Uh, and that's purely for resilience and also load. Now, if the agent's busy, there's other agents to take over. Also, consider having uh, dedicated retrieval agents wherever possible, certainly in production, um, because obviously the, it's, it's a key part. The actual retrieval of the artifact is very important. So you don't want it to be bogged down and do another thing. So if you've got an agent dedicated to retrieval for production, that's fantastic. And we talked about the, uh, the artifact distribution, how we actually, the artifacts move from agents to execution servers. Uh, now, obviously, that means that that data is cached as it goes. So you need to look at the size of the artifacts that you use for deployments. Uh, as you can see here, what we're saying is look at the, the biggest size and perhaps double it. Uh, and that's the kind of disk space you should be looking for on your execution servers for caching. Uh, otherwise, what will happen is um, the execution servers will run out of disk space. Now also, with the agents, now we talked a bit about the supernetting, so we recommend that obviously agents are configured to talk to multiple execution servers to allow for you know, no single point of failure. Uh, and as we said, if uh, an agent is configured to multiple execution servers and one of those were to fail, the agent will automatically fail over and fail back. Now if you do that, so if you imagine you've got um, two execution servers and each has got 500 agents, and they're configured as a supernet, uh, and that execution server fails, you need to make sure that the other server can cope with a thousand agents, basically. And so when you configure it, you need to say, right, I've got a thousand agents in this, in this environment. We'll configure a supernet, the two execution servers, and we'll make sure that half the agents are on one and half on the other. Now, it doesn't have to be an exact science. You haven't got to make sure they're exactly balanced. However, if it's imbalanced, it can affect performance, because you find that Perhaps one execution server is busier than the others. So we always recommend try and balance the agents across execution servers. And as you, if you've used release automation, you will know that in the NIMI config file there is this warning. So today it's still set to 200. So the number of connected agents um, currently is 200 in the file. And when you get to the warning, which I think is 180 what will happen is the execution server will tell the agent to go somewhere else if it can because that execution server needs to fill up. So when you install an execution server, um, you need to go into the NIMI config and actually modify these settings to match the number of agents you expect to have connected. So like I said, um, with the 6.x system, as long as you've got the relevant hardware, um, you can have up to 1,000 agents. So you can change this setting here to be a thousand. And we normally say set the warning to like 950 or something. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, um, when we talk about supernet is make sure that the, the second one in the pair has enough capacity to take over from the primary. So you always need to make sure that you're allowing for the worst case in that one execution server might fail 
and then the other one can take over all the load from the original one. Which we, as you know, when you're also defining any sort of high availability, you should look at uh, can we actually cope with the failover. So in, in summary, um, what we just talked about is you now the, the high level architecture of release automation, the, the high availability, uh, how we architect from the firewall and also the execution server routing. Um, everything we just talked about, you can download from uh, the community. So there's a, the architecture document is on the community site, is the link. Um, there's basically what I just showed you, along with much more details on there. So um, I'd say go there and download that. And at this point, I think we're ready for, if you have any questions, um, I think if you either put in the, the Q&A or I think if you pound sticks, you can ask a question. And I just wanted to mention really quickly, um, the link that Keith provided, I will put into the webcast recap uh, later today. Okay, so we do have some questions in the Q&A, Keith. Uh, I um, think I answered those three. Yeah, so we have two, four of them, starting with Brian Anderson at 11.20. Well, I don't see that. <laughs> Let me just refer. Okay. Okay, I can uh, read it off I, to you. I, I, I didn't know I was off scroll down. It's on a different screen. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, so, can a proxy be used for the for 3DNS or Big IT? Um, yes. So, basically, what you need is a, uh, a redirector. You need to make sure that all of the traffic is being sent to the active node. So, be that through um, a DNS alias or big IP, as long as you can make sure that nothing talks to the secondary, then it's good. Um, the reason I say that is if someone tries to log into the secondary, the system will then try and initiate a failover. And then you end up in a race condition where it can flip-flop, where both, execute, where both um, management servers can try and become active. So you have to be very careful that oh, no, no one connects machines through their physical IP addresses. They must all come through an external IP address. Um, then there's a question about is the HA feature automatic? Then yes. So what happens is automatically, um, if the primary stops updating the timestamp, the secondary will automatically take over. Uh, once failover, then yeah, okay, okay, that's been answered. Um, uh, is there a failover option for next? Right, so, so as I said, um, the management servers are active-passive, so it's, it's, there's no active-active. Um, you can force a failover through JMX. So I mentioned that no, the, the system will fail over if the timestamps aren't created. Uh, also, if you go to JMX, there's a method that you can run that actually shows you um, which of the nodes is active, and also you can instigate a failover. So in JMX, you can click on a method that says failover, and it'll automatically move. Um, if you're not aware of JMX, if you look at the architecture document in the back, there's a whole section on the different ports we use and the passwords, and in there it's got the details to log into JMX. And can we deploy execution servers into a container, e.g. Docker? Um, I'm not sure if we officially support that. There's no reason why you can't, because you know, literally it's just a, an application. Um, but I will double check if we've got any, any limitations on that. Uh, okay, so if the HA node partition and somehow disagrees about who is most recent, is there kind of core and witness system? Okay, so, <coughs> so I think the question is, no, if there's this discrepancy with the, the HA nodes, who wins? Um, basically, it's yeah, like I said, we can get into this race condition. So if the clocks are wrong on the management server, you can get a race condition where they both think they should be active, um, in which case the system never really starts, ends up flip-flopping. Uh, there isn't any arbitrary way of fixing that, apart from fixing the time. Um, does that answer your question? In fact, I, I'm, I'm going to be coming to see you tomorrow, Spike. So um, perhaps we can talk about it tomorrow, because I'm coming down to see, um, see you tomorrow. So we can discuss it tomorrow if you want. So 
Any other questions? Okay. Well, those are all the questions for today. Um, we will wrap up. I just put a poll up that asked you to please rate the quality of today's webcast topic. If you could give us a vote on that, um, we really appreciate your feedback and we take it back and try to schedule out more webcasts along the line of what you're interested in. Um, we do have two upcoming webcasts in July. Please check them out on the community and RSVP to them if you're interested. Um, otherwise, if you have any questions that weren't addressed on the call today, um, you can always post them to the community or reach out to Keith or myself and we will get it to the right people. Um, Please expect that the recording will be posted later today along with the presentation that was given and um, the Q&A transcript. So um, thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate it. And we will see you out in the communities. Thank you so much. Thanks, Keith. Thanks a lot. Thank you.